Good afternoon. It's Monday the 15th of June 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish, and we're delighted to be joined by David Scott, bringing us Northern Exposure from north of the border. Well, it's all good news today, uh, Mike. It's just amazing news today. The shops have opened, uh, Brian, and here's uh, Rishi Sunak tweeting out a uh, fantastic uh, image of himself. Uh, thank you to everyone who's worked hard to get these stores open safely today uh, as our high streets reawaken, reawaken, mind, they don't reopen, they reawaken, as our high streets reawaken and non-essential retail opens for business, uh, they will need your help. Get out there, shop safely and give your local businesses the support they need. So uh, this, is, uh, this is what he had to say then. Uh, he said, from Monday, shops selling books, clothes and electronics are able to open for business for the first time in more than two months as part of our plan to gradually and safely reopen the economy or reawaken it, depending on your point of view. He said that there are nearly 7,000 high streets across the country, each providing a valuable service to their community. Uh, they will be vital in helping kickstart the economy as we recover from the virus. So the BBC this morning was deeply, deeply excited about this uh, on the Radio 4 Today programme. In fact, it was the headline, the main headline, uh, during the Radio 4 Today programme this morning. Uh, and this was from the website, long queues as shops reopen in England after lockdown. This was the most uh, egregious piece of uh, fake news I've heard in a little while. Because of course, in the, in the reports, uh, they were suggesting or implying that, the, that uh, brilliant, everything's back to normal. There are long queues outside the shops. But of course, the photograph tells the truth, doesn't it? Because the only reason there are long queues is because of the social distancing measures. Uh, and uh, the fact is that people are having to wait for a long time to get into into any shops. But let's uh, let's move on with it and see what else they were showing. More pictures from around the country. Uh, so with these, these shops are not open, Mike, are they? Well, they're the, well, we'll come on to that in a second. <laughs> the I mean, doors are open, but they're not open as businesses. No, no, no. indeed, indeed. And uh, well, here's uh, uh, um, Cambridge, I think. Uh, and uh, well more Canterbury uh, and so uh, Canterbury of course a couple of years ago was ranked the second healthiest uh, shopping centre in the UK uh, so it was per looking after our, our well-being as and therefore it became the healthiest or the second healthiest Edinburgh in fact David was the healthiest uh, high street in the UK for our well-being and apparently this uh, uh, this was according to the Royal Society for Public Health apparently uh, cafes and vape shops are positive influences in high streets uh, and uh, off licenses, takeaways and empty shops are negative impacts. Uh, that's just by the way. Uh, but my point here is because this this photograph here pretty much illustrates what high streets were like only a few months ago with quite a lot of people in them, despite the fact that the high street was already suffering economically. So now instead of uh, a bustling uh, crowd, we now have people standing in queues and having to wait for a very long time to get into the shops in the first place. Does this make a viable business? Uh, well, YouGov then have a poll today. Will Britons flock back to the high street? And they're suggesting no, that in fact half of shoppers will stay away. Uh, they're saying that uh, uh, people are uncomfortable about returning, particularly to clothing stores. Uh, and uh, so I think we'll leave it to HMV's uh, Doug Putman. Uh, who was speaking on the Radio 4 Today programme this morning. And he said, if you've got the same cost structure to run the business, but sales are down even 20%, it makes a lot of companies unviable. So David, let me bring you into the programme here. Uh, it makes lots of companies unviable, 20% fall. But in fact, the way things are going here, the footfall is more likely to be 60, 70, 80%, the, the reduction in footfall. So how can any retail business make any kind of profit under those circumstances? It's almost impossible. Um, it must uh, reflect hugely on the amount of rental income that goes into the property sector as well. It simply can't be sustained anymore. Uh, the, the, the retail sector was pretty much on its knees, uh, Princess Street, Edinburgh apart, uh, before all of this happened. And we're all familiar with the empty shops as uh, people have turned to online shopping and the combination of traffic congestion, um, roads departments that don't want cars and, and uh, parking charges have dissuaded people from going into town centres. And they're empty and there's vacant shops and it's just going to get worse. Uh, 
the uh, good news is though, if I if I go to England, if I drive to England, if Nicola allows me to drive to England, I might be able to queue up and eventually buy a book. So you know that's something. Uh, well, we'll come on to books uh, a little bit later. In fact, right at the very end of the program. But look, uh, we don't need to worry because the Bank of England, David, is ready to act. Uh, this is Andrew Bailey, of course. Uh, he was speaking uh, after figures at the end of last week. After figures uh, showed that uh, the company, uh, the economy, had shrunk by uh, twenty percent in April. We mentioned that on Friday's program. Uh, Bailey said uh, we're very much in the midst of this. Uh, he said, however, that he wasn't. Well, he was pretty much expecting that figure. It was pretty much in line with what the bank expected. Obviously, it's a dramatic and big number, he said, but actually it's not a surprising number. But he said that uh, that they're going to, to act on this. So the question is, how are they going to act? Well, in two ways. Uh, first of all, uh, as the Financial Times was suggesting uh, in April, uh, printing money is a valid response to the coronavirus crisis. Well, they're going to do much more of that. So uh, they're expected to... Uh, on Thursday's uh, monetary policy meeting, increased quantitative easing by £100 billion to bring it up to £745 billion. That's a third of the size of the UK economy as it was before uh, COVID-19. Uh, it's probably uh, two thirds of the size of the UK economy after we get out of this, uh, if we get out of this. Uh, but the other thing that's going to happen is that uh, interest rates are likely to be uh, taken down to zero now. Whether that's really significant or not, is, is an interesting question because they're currently 0.1%. Does it really matter if they go down to zero? Uh, it doesn't certainly doesn't matter to the average saver, as my bank told me, uh, sent me a letter a day or two ago telling me that it's uh, brilliant because uh, my savings account, Brian, will now uh, be offering me 0.01% interest Strong on my savings. It is a struggle. Uh, but uh, uh, but it goes on because uh, this is the LSE. Uh, and they're suggesting that direct cash transfers to households uh, should be part of the uh, Bank of England's response to this. Uh, and they're saying that uh, that this is a potential different design of central bank monetary stimulus uh, and that the Bank of England's own research shows that cash transfers to households could be just as effective as quantitative easing and stimulating economies. Studies of programmes of universal basics, uh, universal payments to households show the endless, endless, David, endless, potential benefits of universal basic income. <laughs> Dear me. I mean, there's so much stupid in that last piece. It's just incredible. Yeah, the 0.1% the interest rate cut, that'll fix things. I mean, who gives this guy his job? Does he not feel a sense of embarrassment coming up with this lame stuff? And yes, helicopter money, universal basic income. We, we did an article on this in 2017. It was a bad idea then. It's a bad idea now. The article is called uh, Masquerade Paper Pound Notes on Parade. And it seems to be more relevant now than it was when it was written. Uh, um, absolutely. But it doesn't end there because if we're looking at universal basic income and quantitative easing and interest rates going to zero or below, uh, well, have a look at this from the other side of the Atlantic. And I can't imagine it's going to be too long before we start seeing this type of thing here as well. So this is Hertz, the car rental company, uh, and they issued a uh, news release on, I think, the 26th of May, basically saying that they were going into uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy reorganization. Sorry, that was on the 22nd of May. Uh, but of course, this has been building up for quite some time. So if we go back uh, just a few years ago, uh, Hertz sold its equipment retail unit, a uh, rental unit, sorry. Uh, it raised $2 billion, uh, $2 billion from that sale, uh, and they used some of that money to pay back uh, some debt, and they also used it, some of it to buy back some of its own stock. Um, so since then, or in the last number of years, Hertz has built up $20.6 billion of uh, debt by March, the end of March this year. Um, and uh, of course, that had the inevitable result on their stock price. Uh, and so on the 26th of May, when they uh, released, made that press release about, uh, or a couple of days after that, it was down to, uh, what's that, 56 cents it's back up to uh, $2.83 per share uh, today. Um, but don't worry, uh, because in the courts uh, in the United States, yes, uh, over just before the weekend, sorry, uh, Hertz, which, let me remind you, is bankrupt, has been granted approval by the courts to sell up to $1 billion of shares. Uh, and they have indeed sold those to uh, Jeffrey's LLC, which is an a sort of vulture fund in Wall Street, uh, which is going to sell them on to investors. Uh, what kind of investors would buy these? 
Uh, well, you need to go to the likes of Robin Hood, uh, the sort of day trading app, uh, which where apparently there's all kinds of people who are very, very keen uh, to buy Hertz stock. Three and a half thousand Robin Hood investors who held Hertz stock uh, on the 12th of June. Uh, and there are now 170,000 investors in Hertz stock through Robin Hood. Uh, so, David, yet another way to print money, uh, you might say, uh, because uh, now it's corporate uh, debt, which is effectively being pushed onto uh, shareholders. This is incredible stuff. Uh, and is this, an, is this an example that if you take all of the government bonds negative, um, the treasury bonds negative, and there's no yield anywhere, that uh, all the investment companies look for riskier and riskier deals until they put a billion dollars into a company that's already in bankruptcy and has been in financial trouble for a decade. Uh, that, that indeed seems to be the case. And of course, as more and more companies, which have also been in, in financial trouble for a long time, as more and more companies uh, suffer the effects of, of this shutdown, this lockdown, uh, we're going to see much more of this, I think, and we, I don't imagine it'll be too long before, before we start seeing it on this side of the Atlantic as well. Um, so, just to uh, ask a question: yes. is, is Hertz being chosen as um, as some sort of public distraction? We've, we, what are they? They're a car rental and equipment rental company. This is not the heart of manufacturing and and uh, the essence of uh, the survival of nation states, is it? So why have we chosen Hertz? Uh, no, well, I mean, Hertz, Hertz has just managed to find themselves uh, a nice little way to stay in existence for a little bit longer, it seems. Uh, but, uh, but nobody's well, commenting also, on what, what it actually means. Also, it's a brand from the past. I mean, in the, in the 1960s, Hertz was the number one car rental company in the world. They had a huge advertising budget. Everybody knows their name. Right? And if this is one part of a giant sigh up in the public that you don't want an important uh you know supplier of, of critical infrastructure you want someone where everyone knows their name absolutely no that so that's what's going on economically today but of course over the weekend david uh, protests in london but let's uh, start with uh, an opinion piece that you wrote for the column uh, and we published i think on friday Yes, this, this is the title of Monumental Errors. This is my assessment of where we, where we are with respect to Black Lives Matter. All of the criticism of this country regarding slavery and all of the uh, controversy over statues. So I hope people will, will look at this article and read it and comment on it. And uh, some might even be uh, motivated to, to write replies to it. I, I hope they do. Um, on the subject of Monumental Errors, we have also Channel 4. God bless them, All right? Because we need some light relief. So here we have the chair of the Lambeth Independent Police Advisory Group getting interviewed by Cathy Newman. And for some reason, it's always Cathy Newman. Cathy Newman, yeah. Yes. So she said, that this, this, uh, the, the chair of the uh, Lambeth Independent Police Advisory Group said, the violence and venom, the rage against the police was totally horrific. She's obviously talking about the, quote, right wing um, uh, protests. Uh, so this is uh, uh, so this 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 dear woman was then asked a few questions, and she was asked about the statues, and specifically, Cathy asked her about uh, whether she thought uh, the statue of Winston Churchill should be removed. So uh, uh, Lorraine Jones, who's uh, independent police advisory group um, chair and pastor and community activist, said that uh, well, she'd heard so many different things about about Churchill. She'd heard. Uh, he was a racist. She'd heard that he was a hero, but she'd never met him herself, so she hadn't made up her mind. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's yeah. Okay, it's one way of doing now, it, isn't it? No, no. I'm 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 poking fun at the, at the lady for not knowing that 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 that, that Sir Winston Churchill is no longer with us. Um, and at least she was. At least she was withholding judgment until she'd met him so there was there was some there was some merit in that i suppose but it does show you this is a, a community leader the head of the police advisory group it shows you the the standard of people who are being selected for leadership roles mm. in our current society it, so it shows you the impact of lack of education 
on our current society. And it shows you, you get to a point where you'll be able to convince people of almost anything because they have no knowledge base to resist lies, manipulation, emotional you know, calls, etc. This is a problem. Um, now, coming to the, uh, the, the, the London um, events over the weekend, um, there was some, some veterans went down to um, parade uh, outside, uh, alongside the, the cenotaph and to protect it from further damage. Now, th there was initially a very large group of, of, of veterans going down. Um, most, um, and, and we've got David Ellis to thank for, for some of this, for, for some of the work he was doing to raise the alarm. Most realized that this was a trap, that they were going to be painted as far right and um, they weren't going down to a situation where any good could come of it. Um, uh, but some veterans felt so strongly that they felt they had to go. Um, so this uh, this gentleman is, is called uh, Dean Cumberbatch, and he's a former infantryman. I'm not sure of which regiment he's from. And uh, he's, he's, he's been through a lot for his country, and he loves his country. And he went down to protect one of the most venerated symbols of this country, uh, the Cenotaph in London, from vandalism. And uh, how was he treated? I've got a short clip from a very important video that he put up uh, that gives you an idea how he and the veterans who were standing beside him uh, were treated that day. Love and respect. That's the truth. We were set up. We were set up, we was taunted, chastised, wound up, used and abused, spat at. But we kept our calm for the sake of the veterans community. So what happened was the, the police escorted the veterans down to the cenotaph and they then informed the veterans that this was a sterile area and they weren't allowed to be there and they would be arrested and they blocked them and they sneered at them and they threatened them and they threatened them and they threatened them and the veterans stood the ground for hours and the police treated them with contempt and it was uh, a, a shocking experience for that man and so many others I'm sure because these are men who love the country who have risked their lives for the country who have been very often harmed in foreign wars where they volunteer to defend the country but of course politicians who are, had no, dis, no, no intention of doing any such thing sent them off to do things in foreign lands that didn't defend the country and they've come back and um, they were treated like criminals. They were treated like scum. They were treated um, with a kind of callousness that, that really, I think, struck them. And th this is why, this is, we, I want to talk in uh, extra time about the whole concept of um, a government of occupation. This is where this came from, because we've seen this so often, where good people go to the authorities to or, or, or take some action which they think is right and if the government was in any way straight or even neutral or even just not if it was still a government the, these actions would make sense but once you realize it's not a government it's an occupying power the actions become very unwise and we have to we have to shout out to the veterans and other people in this in, in similar positions that you can no longer trust those in authority in this country, you have to be much more careful in that. Uh, absolutely. Now, David, it was pretty clear uh, from some of the headlines that were coming out. I think The Guardian was one newspaper that particularly st st uh, stuck out to me uh, towards the end of last week, uh, that, the, that the mainstream press was, was winding themselves up towards uh, painting anybody that turned up to, quote, protect the monuments. Uh, as being far right extremists, and that seems to be what has happened over the weekend. But that's that's the the allegation the the far right. I'm, I'm still to meet the far right. If anyone knows who the far right are, let me know. I'll go and talk to them and find out what they think. Because 
this is not a, a label or a movement that I actually see uh, in, in any significant regard in this country. But anyway, uh, here we have a talk radio um, tweet and a series of photographs. Now, I've, I've seen this and I've seen some video from this as well. And I, I, I want to discuss what I, what I think is going on here because what you have is put, put forward as a, as a punch up between, the, the, uh, uh, between BLM and, and, quote, the far right. But I don't think that's what's happening at all. Um, what you've got is five or six people who are there to hunt people um, from the quote other side and and the five or six people surround one man and uh, when he's attacked from one side and he tries to defend himself um, then then they they, they, uh, they move in and I've got a few um, other uh, sort of close-ups of this photograph here. If you could bring that up, Mike, thank you. So the, the man's here defending himself in the front, and then this big lad round the back sneaks up behind him and 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 clubs him with his fist, right? Because you know it's it's five or six on to one, but you've still got to sneak up behind people because these are these are brave people, right? They're not out, they're not out to defend any cause, they're out to cause as much harm as possible. Now, the other chap is standing behind him in the grey cap. He's holding something in his hand. It looks to me like a glass bottle. And I think that explains why after they knock this guy to the ground and the six of them spend some time kicking him, um, he ends up in the state you see here, because I think that glass bottle has been used uh, to drive it into his head. So this is what you're dealing with. So that's a group that's it's nothing to do with Black Lives Mattering, right? It's nothing to do with any of the PR spin. That's a group that's gone down there to create trouble, to hunt people and to cause as much injury as possible. Now, this reminds me of what we saw in, the, in places like uh, the Ukraine, where you had demonstrators out and then to rile things up, there were snipers killing people at random. Syria right. as well. So we if we go back to 2011, yeah. David, S Syria as well. This is what started started off Syria, for goodness sake. Yes. So we don't have snipers in Britain yet, but this, I think, is the equivalent. I think that's what we're seeing. They're trying to get a reaction. They're trying to escalate it until there's, there's blood in the streets. That's And then there'll be the clampdown. That's what's going on here. Now, there's other stories, of course, and I, I want to highlight this because it's been it's been um, very prominent in all of the mainstream media. So here you see hero Black Lives Matter supporter reveals the moment he carried white far right protester whose life was in danger to safety as he declares it's not black versus white, it's everyone versus the racists. Now, a couple of things about this. The, the man's called Patrick Hutchison. Um, the, the far right man in inverted no, commas. The, 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 the BLM man who's carrying the, the, the quote far right man. Right. So the, the oh, hero yeah, right. is called Patrick Hutchinson. Now, he, he's been interviewed in, in all of the mainstream media. A couple of observations. One, he, he's, he's, he's a personal trainer. He obviously works out. He obviously looks after himself. If he's, he, he seems to have a business as a personal trainer. This could be right. Some people have suggested this is entirely fake and it's just a set up for the cameras. I'm not so sure. Uh, if if this man has gone there and he has, because of what he does for a living, a self-discipline that comes from genuine dedication to a craft like, like sports and conditioning training, then he may well have had the wherewithal to react differently to the thugs round about him. But there's a couple of things that that seem strange. Him and his, I think his crew, the chap in the helmet in the photograph, I think, with them, um, rescued this man. He didn't seem, when he was interviewed, to realise that the side he was on was trying to kick this man to death. There didn't seem to be any realisation that, wait a minute, why am I here? Why am I with these people? There didn't seem to be any judgement on the people who were trying to kick the man to death. 
He recognized it was wrong. He saved him. And God bless him for doing so. But there didn't seem, he didn't seem to be questioning what he needs to question. Now, th there was one other thing that was pointed out by someone on Twitter about this photograph and, and, and those are the gloves he's wearing. Right? The, the gloves are, are what you call tactical gloves. They've got built-in knuckle dusters. So he went all dressed in black with a black face covering and black's a color for anarchy. Uh, wearing gloves like that, that doesn't seem that he wasn't looking for trouble. And yet he, he saved this man. So t assuming that this, 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 this is not a, a press setup and Reuters did just happen to get the photograph, did he have a change of heart? Did he look at what was happening round about him and think this is wrong? I, I, I think it's very interesting as to what actually went on here. Now, the, the police obviously are treating the, the, the quote unquote far right who are nothing of the sort protesters um, very severely. There's a lot of taunting, there's a lot of riot shields. The police are all uh, kitted out with helmets and um, there's a lot of them. And of course, this is quite different from the BLM protesters. But the BLM protesters, well, it, it, it appears now that the police have been told to kneel because if they refuse to take the knee, that could start trouble. Uh, the force tells officers who don't kneel at Black Lives Matter that they could become the focus of protest or attention. So the police are now saying that the BLM people are, are potentially very violent and they need to be placated by kneeling down in supplication to them or they'll beat the living daylights out of you. Um, this seems to be, at the very best, coming from an organization, from a system that no longer believes in anything and is just trying to get past the next weekend. I think it's actually worse than that. I think they're trying to do something here to change society. Now, we come then to what exactly is BLM. We talked last week about BLM being anti-family because they're overtly anti-family. They want to destroy the family, which is a standard left-wing approach. Um, so they've now got a UK BLM who've got a fundraising page, which is doing very nice business. It's, it's raking in the cash. Um, it says they were founded in 2016 to dismantle imperialism. Now, I don't know about you, but I thought the empire ended back at about the time of Suez, but there we go. Capitalism, so no more free markets. White supremacy, which is nonsense. Patriarchy, which is having um, men be men. Don't want that. Uh, and the state structures that disproportionately harm black people in Britain and around the world. Uh, and they mentioned Brazil, uh, which is an odd place to look for racism, but there we go. Uh, but that's because Brazil have a free market type government. Uh, we're developing new and exciting ways of organizing and um, on the go. Now, they then say Wagwan in Babylon, Britain. Right? Now, Wagwan is a West Indian word, which means what's happening. So this is the rap sheet against Britain. This is, this is the things that are wrong with Britain. Number one, black communities are hardest hit by the coronavirus pandemic. This is racism. So the coronavirus is racist. Uh, could it be something to do with levels of vitamin D and the effects that skin tone has on that? No, well, maybe not, but coronavirus is racist. Um, and then we've got the Windrush scandal, which seems a strange thing to be beating people up in the street about, but there we go. We've got over 1,700 people have died in police custody. The most violent examples being black men. Well, that's strange because they use a number and then they use a subjective bit of reasoning, of subjective judgment. That would be because if you actually look at the numbers, most of the people who died in custody would be white men. So they're, they're trying to manipulate people there. Uh, they're saying black workers are played up to less than 20%. But that's, of course, doesn't look at hours worked or the nature of the job. So they're saying this is racism, which, of course, it's not. Um, and this is the standard left wing uh, approach. You just divide people because wherever you put a division, um, you will find that some people are better off than others. Uh, some of the uh, people from um, Chinese origin, for example, are actually doing very well economically. Is that because Britain's pro-Chinese and Racist. Uh, it makes no sense. 
uh, and they then go and say, well, the UK taxpayer paid reparations to slave owners. The, the, the UK taxpayer paid to end slavery is what they're, what they're admitting there, uh, finishing in 2015. But basically, well, we want some money now, and they're talking about redistribution of wealth. So this is pure communism um, in blackface. Okay. Well, it's an embryonic colour revolution, in my opinion. Well, that's what we're seeing happening. It's uh, what, what we need to be discussing in due course and getting the public to uh, look at and research is who is creating the circumstances that we're now seeing unfolding. But I have no doubt that we're seeing effectively revolution fermented, but it's being fermented from within, as you call it, David, the government of occupation. It's not a legitimate government that's wielding power at the moment. Absolutely. And, and, make, and make, make no, just one, one final thing, make no mistake that um, the people who will suffer most from the folly of BLM will be those with dark skin. It will, it, will, it will do only harm to this country and it will harm most of all, it will harm uh, the people that they claim to be protecting. Indeed. Right, okay. If you like what the UK Column does and you would like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to help us out there. Uh, now, where do we go from here? Well, we jump back to the subject of, um, <coughs> excuse me, COVID-19. But in particular, I want to have a look at the Behavioural Insights team. And if anybody listening to the column today is not familiar with them, please go and research them because this is the government's own applied psychology group um, that has been boasting it can change the way people think and behave and they won't even know why their views and values have changed. Um, but of course, the thing we pointed out was that the Behavioural Insights team had been instrumental in setting out the uh, applied psychology policy in order to get people to conform with government instructions. And this had come to light in the SAGE and the SPY B documents. Now, here's the front page of the Behavioural Insights team, and you can see that COVID-19 is a big part of their work at the moment, a behavioural uh, perspective. And this is the organisation that was suggesting that uh, the level of fear needed to be ramped up. People needed to be more fearful in order to obey what the government said, and also that um, they needed to um, be put under pressure within their communities. Now, both those actions, putting people under stress and pressure, are going to have significant adverse effects on anybody who's got a mental health weakness. Um, they may suffer from depression or anxiety or stress, and if you stress them further, you're going to, you're going to hurt them. So we sent a, an email off to the Behavioural Insights team this morning to ask whether they'd carried out any form of mental health risk assessment um, as to what effect that ramping up fear in people was going to have. So this is the first um, section of that uh, email. You can freeze your screen and have a look at it. But it, the details are given, the quote from the SAGE 22 March um, art, uh, minutes where they set, were looking at options for increasing adherence to social distancing. And this is the one where it said that uh, um, the perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased. So we need to make people more fearful. And at the bottom of your screen, it's talking about consideration given to the use of social disapproval. So we've sent that email off asking for a look at their risk assessment. Um, it will be interesting to see whether they've done a risk assessment, because if they haven't, they clearly are not worried about any damage they do on people's mental health. But they're already moving on to the next stage, and uh, we can see this um, from uh, what they're talking about. Don't say it makes you immune. How you frame coronavirus antibody results matters. And uh, encourage people to look at this themselves. But now they're getting into exactly how they can manipulate people when we're talking about some people having the virus but not being affected by it. And they say in this significant graph, the key results shown in the graph below show that only 2% of the people thought they had zero risk of catching coronavirus again when the type of test was framed as an antibody. But this jumped to 6 to 10% when it was framed as immunity. 
less than 1% of people thought they had zero risk uh, when they read the more descriptive framings that said they had a high level of antibodies or a low risk for catching coronavirus again in the future. Essentially, they don't like it um, if you believe that you've actually have it, but had it, but it didn't affect you. Your life's going to move on. They want to bring back into the fear factor and note that on the graph, they're particularly pushing for some sort of health passport. You can see that center in blue and also some form of health certificate. So this is back into manipulating people's minds, but you probably didn't see it. It's top left of the screen. The behavioral insights team is in partnership with the cabinet office. So are we dealing with the government here or are we not dealing with the government? I'm just gonna say for you, David, this is where it gets very interesting because we don't really know who these people are and what their true function is. But if we go on to press releases, it gets very interesting because what do we find that the Behavioural Insights team are declaring their undying loyalty to Black Lives Matter. So whereas they chastise the public for having preconceived and set piece ideas as to what they believe, they then promote in, the, in their own press release that that's exactly what they believe. And I'll just follow this next bit through quickly and then we can have a bit of discussion about it. But down here, you notice that it's boasting that Alex Sutherland from the Behavioural Insights team uh, was appointed to the government What Works Trial Advice Panel. Now, I'd never heard of this at all and I thought uh, it's going to be interesting to see what this is about. So let's have a look. It was launched in 2015 to improve the quality and quantity of trialling across central government. It comprises 50 experts from academia and the civil service. But don't worry, Mike, it's pro bono. These people are completely independent and they're thinking, uh, they're thinking about conducting, sorry, and you should use them if you're thinking about conducting an impact evaluation. So there we are. The panel includes experts with experience in a broad range of policy areas and evaluation methods. And then they list them and there's a lot, encourage people to look. Well, I went and had a look and sure enough, I found um, Alex, uh, Behavioural Insights Team, Chief Scientist, but my goodness, what experience, because he's, he's an expert in crime and justice and education. Good. One or other is not enough for him. He's an expert in all of them. But my question is, how can he be external when BIT itself is already in partnership with the Cabinet Office? So this is trickery. This is a lie on the public. His organisation is in partnership with the Cabinet Office. But when you look at the Cabinet Office, they say, oh, no, he's an external advisor. But this lady also caught my eye, uh, Debella. Here she is. And um, she's one of the Cabinet Office experts and... Uh, what, what is she an expert in? Electoral registration, elections and democracy and, uh, and devolution. But if you go and have a look at her from the LinkedIn page, it gets very interesting because the coloured blocks are where she's providing research capability. Uh, but since uh, January 2013, she's been involved here as associate editor contention the multidisciplinary journal of social protest. And I found this fascinating because I'd like to know why we need that sort of experience inside the cabinet office. You found the document earlier um, this morning, Mike. Uh, so it's published annually, but this is discussing uh, social movements, revolutions or revolutionary waves, quantitative research on protest, social and political theory and methodology, uh, legal and economic implication of social movements, in-depth empirical reports of recent protests, uh, revolution and protests. Mm. And you begin to wonder whether this experience explains that the Cabinet Office really does support Black Lives Matter. And the fact is that we've got the policy being driven from within the government. They want the revolution and they've got the experts in there to advise them. And I just end this section by saying that, of course, we challenge the government over their, um, ex for their support for Extinction Rebellion. And they came back with no answer at all. Mm. So whereas we could improve, approve 
that um, Extinction Rebellion was involved in criminal activity and was recruiting and grooming young people, they didn't want to um, stop it or respond. So David, if you talk about revolution, the government seems to have built all of the machinery in order to put that revolution in place. It does indeed, Brian. It's really quite striking. So the cabinet office of the allegedly conservative government supports unconditionally BLM, and they support the destruction of free market capitalism, the destruction of the family, and uh, massive redistribution of wealth based on skin tone. That's quite a policy, a, a turnaround for the uh, Tories. It is, and it's I think just, there's a lot of questions. Months. I, I don't, I don't remember that. Be, I don't remember that being on their uh, um, policy agenda just uh, just a, just a few months ago when we had an election. Well, there's a lot more to lot more to come out, but I can th I think we can see that the era of party politics is over. There is no party system. We have a cabal that's buried itself inside government, and it's becoming increasingly easy to see what this really is. Um, so let's move on to this then, education. Uh, this is the TESS website. Now, this is uh, originally, it's been in print for a long time, but this was originally the Times Educational Supplement. It's called TESS these days. It's a private, it's separated from the Times, a private organization. Um, and, uh, well, the headline here is Exclusive Department for Education Tries to Gag Teachers on COVID Response. So uh, in a nutshell, basically, in the same way that uh, the government has SAGE, which uh, is there to, to provide the medical and scientific advice with respect to COVID-19, uh, this is, they, they are acknowledging the existence of a COVID-19 response school stakeholder advisory group for the Department for Education. Uh, but unfortunately, whereas uh, SAGE minutes are published and okay, it took a little while to get them, but they're out and they're available. Uh, there are no minutes published for this group. In fact, not only are there no minutes available for this group, but the people involved in it have been required by the Department for Education to sign a personal confidentiality agreement in an effort to protect the secrecy of information uh, discussed in closed meetings. Um, so some people aren't uh, terribly excited about signing this and they've clearly spoken out here. Now, the people involved in the uh, stakeholder advisory group uh, are the NEU Teaching Union, the Association of School and College Leaders, NEHT, Teachers Union, uh, NASUWT Teaching Union, the Chartered College of Teaching, Unison, uh, National Governments Association, uh, National Confederation of School Tests, the department, uh, right? So those are the groups that are involved in that. Uh, just to give you a clue as to what the actual uh, confidentiality, confidentiality agreement said, it said, I declare that I will uh, do all that I reasonably can to protect the secrecy of and avoid disclosure or use of confidential information in order to prevent it from falling into the public domain uh, or the possession of persons not authorized to have such information. Uh, I shall take the highest degree of care, at least the same as I would to protect my own confidential information uh, and inform the department promptly in writing about any misuse or unauthorized disclosure of confidential information, which I become aware of. Um, so, David, what do you think? I mean, why would the Department for Education be so concerned uh, about the advice that's being discussed in these meetings becoming public? Well, this is what I'm wondering. Why is education now being treated as, na as a national secret? Two possible explanations. Maybe they're both true. One, they're doing things that the, that the, uh, the public would not tolerate. And the second is it is a national secret because this is a fusion doctrine and it's all part of hybrid warfare. Uh, absolutely. I think that's a, a fair assessment. Uh, now, let's move on. Uh, on Friday, we had uh, Dr. Piers Robinson on the programme and we were talking about the uh, forthcoming uh, mainstream media attack on him and his colleagues, his academic colleagues. And well, on Saturday, the attack appeared in The Times, uh, The Times view on universities and baseless conspiracy theories academic abuses. Uh, the universities involved should crack down uh, hard rather than allow these theories to circulate unchecked. Uh, I have to say, Brian and David, it's a pretty pathetic article. I'm not going to give it any airtime, but uh, if people want to read it, they can, uh, obviously. Uh, what's interesting about this is that this particular article does not 
get blocked behind the Times paywall. Uh, for whatever reason, the Times has decided that everybody should have free access to this particular well, article. This is all part of desperation that actually it isn't conspiracy theory. What's coming out of the majority of social media, they are pulling the system apart. And this is a, a weak attempt to the fight back. Isn't uh, it? It's, it is pretty pathetic. Uh, but what is not pathetic, however, was Piers Robinson's uh, uh, Twitter uh, thread, which he produced. Um, I'm going to, if you, it's, it is pinned on his uh, uh, Twitter feed. So if you go to at Piers Robinson one on Twitter, you can read this. Uh, quite a number of tweets in this thread. It is an excellently put together uh, thread. And I would ask everybody that is uh, willing to, to share that as widely as possible. Now, uh, moving on. Uh, the other news that came out just before uh, the weekend, of course, was that uh, from today, uh, everybody taking uh, any journeys on public transport will be required to wear a face mask. Uh, and the person who announced that was Grant Shapps during the uh, one of the daily uh, live streams uh, on COVID-19 last week. Uh, so let's briefly have a listen to what he had to say. As we move to recovery, it's more important than ever to protect each other, preventing those showing no symptoms from infecting others. I know there's huge public support for compulsory face coverings. They show respect for our fellow travellers. But for clarity, transport operators will be able to refuse permission to travel where someone isn't using a face covering. And this weekend, I'm taking powers through the Public Health Act, leading to fines for non-compliance too. We'll take a gentle approach to enforcement during the first couple of days. And help will be at hand. In addition to the British Transport Police, the uh, staff from Network Rail, from TfL, Transport for London, and transport operators, in the coming weeks we'll also deploy journey makers to assist and remind commuters of the need to wear face coverings. Okay, so before we come on to the issue of journey makers, uh, David, first of all, uh, he said that it's very important for us to protect each other. Uh, preventing those showing no symptoms from affecting others. Now, of course, uh, there's a bit of a controversy with the World Health Organization at the moment because uh, they made, made a statement on the fact that that asymptomatic uh, people asymptomatic people can't pass this on to somebody else. But of course, uh, what he's mainly referring to is those that are considered to be what they would call pre-symptomatic. So they're saying that uh, in the two or three days before you show symptoms, you're actually they claim more likely to, uh, to to be able to pass this on than, than once you have symptoms. But anyway, nonetheless, uh, we are clearly uh, required now to wear face coverings, despite the fact that there's no evidence to show that this will do anything to reduce the spread, particularly if we're not using medical grade uh, face masks. And remembering that you've got to drop your face mask in order to prove how old you are in shops. So presumably when you do that the bug doesn't come out so well, that's not a problem that 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 would seem to be the case but yeah. that, but let's have a look at, at journey makers then because what is this about uh, well here's uh, volunteering matters for our community website and they have the journey makers in fact are one of their uh, campaigns um so uh, who is this uh well um they our vision, their vision is as a society where everyone can participate in their local community through volunteering and social action. So they've been around for uh, quite a number of years now. Uh, and uh, well, the British government has been ex pretty excited about this over the years. Uh, and uh, well, who is in charge? Well, here's their president, Lord Freud. Uh, David, uh, related to Sigmund Freud in some, to some degree, is that right? A great grandson, yes. And great grandson. Um the uh, uh, great nephew of Edward Bernays, the man who invented propaganda. Ah, okay. Small, it's, it's a small world. It is a small world. Well, anyway, he was also uh, the Minister for Welfare Reform from 2010 uh, until 2016. So uh, maybe that's why he's involved in this. Uh, but then we have Cabinet Office links as well. Uh, one of the uh, other experts that they use is Ms. Rosalind Anderson. Uh, who's uh, who for many years was uh, Director General of the Office for Civil Society in the Cabinet Office and Regional Director of the Government Office for the South East of England uh, and so on. So uh, anyway, coming back to the, uh, the original uh, post here about uh, journey makers, uh, 
it is on behalf, apparently, that this project is being run on behalf of volunteers and commun uh, community sector emergencies partnership. So let's just have a brief look at that. Uh, and here's the uh, Red Cross uh, website. They are one of them, one of the partners in this. The Emergencies Partnership includes the British Red Cross, uh, Business in the Community, St John's Ambulance, uh, National Council for Voluntary Organisations, National Emergencies Trust, National Police Chiefs Council, uh, Muslim Aid, Salvation Army, UK Community Foundations, Victim Support, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. And well, again, we come back to the Cabinet Office and it is, David, staggering that every direction we look these days, the Cabinet Office is there. So this uh, goes straight back, of course, to Mark Sedwell, ultimately. And, you know, you talk about a government of, of occupation, but everything goes back to the Cabinet Office. Everything goes back to the Cabinet Office. Everything goes back to Mark Sedwell. Um, we don't elect him. We can't get rid of him. We we largely not allowed to know what he thinks, what he says, what he does. Uh, but he's everywhere. We, we we follow this this line through, and within two clicks, we're back at the Cabinet Office. It's um, it's it's it, it reminds me of what they used to call the. Uh, what one of the banks, the vampire squid, it's everywhere. It's it's just uh, seems to be strangling our society. Uh, absolutely. So so I mean the the question we haven't answered so far is what are the journey makers? Well, journey makers are volunteers who will travel on the public uh, transport network system and help us as individuals who are too stupid uh, to know what to do. Will help us to make sure we know how to put on our face masks and we'll know how to behave. Uh, when we're on the uh, on the public transport networks, but unfortunately the unions aren't necessarily happy about this. So the rail workers unions are critical of plans for face ma face mask volunteers, according to personnel to, uh, today. Uh, so the RMT deeply unhappy about this. Um, but my question, David, is this: um, What? Where do we? How do we fit in a society? How do we understand our relationships and, and how we're being governed if we have to deal with the police and the police have some kind of uh, official uh, purpose? They have, they, they have some standing in society. Uh, we understand our position with government. But once we have individuals volunteering to decide how we should or should not behave um, in public, where does that, how do we... Where does that leave our relationship with other people that we meet in public? Because these are not uniformed people. These are not people that have taken any kind of oath of office. Where does our relationship to our, or where do we sit in the governance pyramid uh, under these circumstances? Under it, I'm afraid. Crushed. And, and this is <laughs> crushed. And, and this is the issue because in, in a common law society, in a common law country, we're all equal. We're all equal under the law. And that means that you can't do anything to other people that they can't do to you. And it means that your interactions are negotiated. There, there is going to be no negotiation. These, these um, journey makers will be trained to obey the rules, to enforce the rules. So we're going to go from a society of law and a society of negotiation between free men, free women, to a society of rules and enforcers. That's the direction of travel. Can I, can I just help in that? I'm just gonna hold this book up. It's called Stasi Land. It was very kindly sent to me uh, by a lady from Australia. And it's talking about the East German Stasi state. And of course it describes such things as using people to spy on each other, using members of the public to enforce the laws. So we know that where we're headed is to a Stasi state. Mm. We just need to root out the people that are central to driving it. And the cabinet office seems to be well in the, in the, uh, uh, under the microscope at the moment. Uh, absolutely. So uh, David, we're, we're well over time here, but let's just uh, end on this one. Uh, Scotland had a lockdown culture long before COVID. Yes, an excellent article on Spike here from Stuart Wayton um, of Aberty University. He says, uh, one could argue that Scotland had a lockdown culture for some time when it comes to locking or clamping down on what we can say and do, Scotland leads the way. Take the proposed hate crime bill, a bill that goes much further than England's counterpart and attempts to criminalise words. 
Indeed, if passed in its current form, it could lead to preachers being arrested in churches for reading incorrect sections from the Bible. So Stuart, again, um, sounding the alarm here, and he quotes an American thinker uh, called Christopher Lash, um, who, who stated, um, whereas every action is unique and idiosyncratic, behavior falls into patterns that repeat themselves in a predictable fashion. Action, whether it be reckless and impulsive or deliberate and discriminating, is the product of judgment, choice, and free will, whereas behavior is automatic and reflexive. And the reason he's quoting that is he's, he's highlighting the fact that the SNP government have picked up from where Blair left off, um, and it's all about behavioral control, behavioral insights, and it's not about reason, and it's not about judgment, and it's not about treating human beings as human beings. Uh, indeed. Okay, well, look, we started off with uh, Rishi Sunak uh, at a bookshop. Uh, we're going to end with Rishi Sunak at a bookshop. And David, my question to you, this is uh, one of the official photographs from this morning from the Treasury. Uh, my question to you is, uh, which books do you think that Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, would be looking at as he was browsing uh, a bookshop, some kind of deep economics, perhaps? No, it's clearly children's books, but I think the book I would recommend is called Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Uh, well, that, okay, but indeed... Oh, was it Enid, Enid, Enid Blyton? Blyton. That? Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Enid Blyton. Uh, that's what Rishi Sunak was, uh, felt was the most appropriate section of the bookshop to be photographed in. I think okay. that says it all. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yes. I think that's the end of our news today. Um, we... we we can see what we can see. It's obvious at the moment that something is slowly but surely destroying society, the economy and society in UK. This is orchestrated. It's going to a plan. And the task of the wider public is to pull that plan apart as fast as possible. So control, behavioural insights, this is all part of the weapons of the government of occupation. We need to identify who forms that government of occupation. We'll leave it there. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back at the same time on Wednesday. Wednesday. Had trouble with that one. Bye-bye.